Well, welcome, my brothers and sisters. I'm so glad that you are tuning in to our Bible study today. And we are on lesson number five of the Amazing Facts Bible Study Guides, Keys for a Happy Marriage. And I hope that you've had an opportunity to study the previous four that have been posted on YouTube and are receiving a blessing from them as well. But keys for a happy marriage. Now, why should we study out marriage? Why is marriage and the family so important? Well, you can look in the society today of how many marriages fail and end in, in a divorce. And that is not what God desires. He makes marriage to be an everlasting commitment between a husband and wife as long as they both shall live. And so marriage is a very important topic. And I remember going to a family to give Bible studies. And I was thinking, you know, I don't know if I need to be given this Bible study. But, you know, I really did need to. And so uh, I hope that you will enjoy this lesson and will get a, a blessing from the Lord today. Well, before we begin, just bow with me in prayer. Our loving Father, Thank you so much for all thy blessings that you have bestowed upon us. And thank you for the blessing of marriage. And I ask thee to move upon us as we study this lesson. Please teach us and please help us to find more of thy will for our lives. Dear Lord, if there's anyone that is struggling in their marriage right now, please help them to get a blessing from this. If there is anyone that is thinking about getting married anytime soon i hope that they will receive a blessing as well please help me in this study in jesus name amen lesson number five keys for a happy marriage they are the tragedies of divorce bitter ex-spouses broken promises and confused children don't let this happen to your family whether your marriage is going through tough times or is experiencing marital bliss, or even if you're not yet married but are considering it, the Bible offers proven guidance to help your marriage last. It's advice from God, the one who created and ordained marriage. If you've tried everything else, why not give him a chance? Now it says 17 keys for a happier marriage. First off, it says, establish your own private home. Genesis 2.24 says, A man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. God's principle is that a married couple should move out of their parents' homes and establish their own. Even if finances require something modest, such as a one-room apartment, a husband and wife should decide this together as one and remain firm even if someone opposes many marriages would be improved if they would heed this counsel from the lord now it says continue your courtship so many times when people get married the courtship ends but that should not be the case it tells us in first peter 4 8 Above all things, have fervent love for one another, for love covereth a multitude of sins. Her husband praises her, Proverbs 31, 28. She who is married cares how she may please her husband, 1 Corinthians 7, 34. And it tells us in Romans, be kindly affectionate to one another, in honor giving preference to one another. So, if husband and wife are considering each other's concerns and needs above their own, then they're going to be more loving and giving, and the marriage is going to, to blossom and bloom instead of just dry up. Continue or revive your courtship into your married life. Successful marriages don't just happen. They must be developed. Don't take one another for granted or the resultant monotony could harm your marriage. Keep your love for one another growing by expressing it to each other. Otherwise, love might fade and you could drift apart. 
And that's tragic when that happens. But God can even restore people that are drifting apart. Love and happiness are not found by seeking them for yourselves, but rather by giving them to others. So spend as much time as possible doing things together. Learn to greet each other with enthusiasm. Relax. Visit. Sightsee and eat together. Don't overlook the little courtesies, encouragements, and affectionate acts. Surprise each other with gifts or favors. Try to outlove each other. And don't try to make more out of your marriage than you put into it. Lack of love is the biggest destroyer of marriage. Number three, remember that God is the one that joined you together in marriage. Matthew 19, 5 and 6. Come with me there to Matthew 19. Verses 5 and 6. Matthew chapter 19. Verses 5 and 6. And th this is Jesus speaking. And he said, For this cause shall a man leave father and mother, and shall cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. Wherefore they are no more twain, but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, let no man put it asunder. Now just think about that. God is the one that joins you together in marriage. Whenever you stand up there and make your marital commitments and marital vows that is recorded in the books of heaven and you are married in the sight of God and it is God that is officially joining you together now just think about that that's a lot to ponder it's a very, marriage is a very weighty matter has love nearly disappeared from your home while the devil wants to break apart your marriage by tempting you to give up don't forget that god himself joined you together in marriage and he desires that you stay together and be happy he will bring happiness and love into your lives if you will obey his divine commandments. With, all, with God, all things are possible. Don't despair. God's Spirit can change your heart and your spouse's heart if you will ask him and let him do so. Now this is a very important principle that is getting ready to bring up. Guard your thoughts. The scripture tells us, as he thinks in his heart, in his heart, so is he. Proverbs 23, 7. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife. Exodus 20, verse 17. Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it spring the issues of life. Proverbs 4, 23. And whatever things are true, noble, just, pure, lovely, of good report, meditate on these things. Philippians 4 8. The wrong kind of thinking can profoundly harm your marriage. The devil will tempt you with thoughts like, Our marriage was a mistake. She doesn't understand me. I can't take much more of this. We can always divorce if necessary. I'll go home to mother. Or he smiled at that woman. This kind of thinking is dangerous because our thoughts ultimately govern our actions. Avoid seeing, saying, reading, or hearing anything that will associate or associate with anyone who suggests being unfaithful. Thoughts uncontrolled are like an automobile left in neutral on a steep hill, and the result can be very dash, uh, disastrous. That has happened to many a home. And we don't want that to happen in our lives, brethren. It tells us never to go to bed angry with one another. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath. Ephesians 4.26 Confess your trespasses to one another. James 5.16 Forgetting those things which are behind. Philippians 3.13 And be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake, forgiven you. Ephesians 4.32 To remain angry over hurts and grievances 
big or little, can be dangerous. Unless addressed in a timely manner, even little problems can become, can become set in your mind as convictions and can adversely affect your outlook on life. This is why God said to let your anger cool down before going to bed. Be big enough to forgive and to say, I'm sorry. After all, no one is perfect and you are both on the same team. I like how it phrases this. So be gracious enough to admit a mistake when you make it. Besides, making up is a very pleasant experience with unusual powers to draw marriage partners closer together. God suggests it and it works. Number six, keep Christ at the center of your home. Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who built it. Psalms 127.1 and it tells us, in all your ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct your paths. Proverbs 3, 6. And the peace of God, which surpasseth all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Philippians 4, 7. This really is the greatest principle, because it's the one that enables all others. The vital ingredient of happiness in the home is not diplomacy, strategy, or our effort to overcome problems, but rather in a union with Christ. Hearts filled with love for Christ will not be far apart for long. With Christ in the home, a marriage has a greater chance at being successful. Jesus can wash away bitterness and disappointment and restore love and happiness. It tells that we should pray together. Husbands and wives should pray together. Watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Matthew 26, 41. Pray for one another, James 5, 16. And if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to you liberally. James 1, verse 5. So pray with one another. You ever heard the statement that the family that prays together stays together? I'm sure that there is great truth to that. This is a wonderful activity that will help your marriage succeed beyond your wildest dreams. Kneel before God and ask Him for true love for one another, for forgiveness, for strength, for wisdom, for the solution to problems. God will answer. You won't be automatically cured of every fault. But God will have greater access to change your heart and actions. So no matter what it is, no matter what the trouble, whether it's financial struggles or maybe there's tension in the home, just take it to the Lord privately, but also take it to the Lord together in prayer. This is vital, this next point, agreeing that divorce is not the answer what god has joined together let not man separate you know god is the one that joins a husband and wife together and so even if a husband and wife goes before a magistrate and asks for a divorce if there are no spiritual grounds there for divorce that are laid out in the bible then you might get a divorce in the, by the law of the land, but you are not divorced in the eyes of God because God is the one that joined you together. So that's very important that everyone understands that. Matthew 19, 9. Let's come, come with me there to Matthew chapter 19, verse 9. Matthew 19, verse 9, and again, this is Jesus speaking. And I say unto you, whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication, and shall marry another, committeth adultery. And whoso marrieth her which is put away, doth commit adultery. Now this is not some type of just... Uh, This is not just some some type of something that we can come up with uh, in our own mind 
some type of understanding that we can up with our own mind. This is something that Jesus said, and it is very plain. I was telling this verse to someone, and and uh, unfortunately, the individual thought that, that that was just the way that I was interpreting the scripture. But I believe that if we really seek the Lord and ask for understanding of the text, the text is very clear on the subject. So it, marriage is a very important subject to understand, and it is a vital commitment. And marriage needs to be for life. The woman who has a husband is bound by the law to her husband as long as he lives. Romans verse 7, Romans 7 verse 2. The Bible says that the ties of marriage are meant to be unbreakable. Divorce is allowed only in cases of adultery, but even then it is not demanded. Forgiveness is always better than divorce, even in the case of unfaithfulness. When God ordained the first marriage in Eden, he designed it for life. Thus, marriage vows are among the most solemn and binding for a person to take on. But remember, God meant for marriage to elevate our lives and, met our, and meet our needs in every way. Harboring thoughts of divorce will tend to destroy your marriage. Divorce is always destructive and is almost never a solution to the problem. Instead, it usually creates greater problems financial troubles, grieving children, etc. You know, in America, there are so many broken homes over the past, I really don't know how many years, I wouldn't doubt more than 50 years, broken homes and people get divorced for unbiblical grounds and then they might marry someone else and raise up children and have little children already by this other spouse and then when they read this text they're very concerned about their relationship to God and their relationship with their new with their new spouse and for first I would say that they are being convicted by the Holy Spirit that they have sinned and they need to take that to God and ask forgiveness for their sin but when they have children already in the home when they have born children or adopted children in that home with their new spouse, God would not want to break up a family. So we need to understand that. God is merciful, but if a family, if a husband and wife splits up for unbiblical grounds, they need to not be dating, they need to not be worrying about the opposite sex, they need to try to reconcile the home and abide by the standard that God lays out in his holy word. Number nine, keep the family circle close tightly. You shall not commit adultery. Exodus 20, 14. The heart of her husband safely trusts her. She does him good and not evil all the days of her life. Proverbs 31, 11 and 12. The Lord has been witness between you and the wife of your, of your youth, with whom you have dealt treacherously, Malachi 2.14. And there's a lot of verses that they're touching on from, from Proverbs chapter 6. Keep you from the evil woman. Do not lust after her beauty in your heart, nor let her allure you with her eyelids. Can a man take fire to his bosom and his clothes not be burned? So is he who goes in to his neighbor's wife. Whoever touches her shall not be innocent. Private family members, fa family matters should never be shared with others outside your home, not even parents. So many times that one of the spouse, they might be having marital troubles and they say if it's a man and, and he might go and talk to a co-worker or a woman about it and that that is inappropriate there I'm sure that there have been many uh, adulterous situations to arise from that type of behavior so we don't want we don't want to be doing that a person outside the marriage to sympathize with or listen to complaints can be used by the devil 
to estrange the hearts of a husband and a wife. Solve your private home problems privately. No one except a minister or a marriage counselor should be involved. Always be truthful with each other and never keep secrets. Avoid telling jokes at the expense of your spouse's feelings and vigorously defend each other. Adultery will always hurt you and everyone else in your family. God who knows our mind, body, and feelings said you shall not commit adultery. If flirtations have already begun, break them off immediately or shadows could settle over your life that cannot easily be lifted. Number 10. God describes love. Make it your daily goal to experience it. Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself, is not puffed up, does not behave rudely, does not seek its own, is not provoked, thinks no evil, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. That's from 1 Corinthians 13, 4-7. This Bible passage is one of God's greatest descriptions of love. Read it again and again. Have you made these words a part of your marriage experience? True love is not mere sentimental impulse, but rather a holy principle that involves every aspect of your married life. With true love, your marriage stands a far greater chance of success. Without it, a marriage will likely fail quickly. Number 11, remember that criticism and nagging destroy love. Does anyone enjoy being nagged all the time? No. No, so we should learn from that so we wouldn't want to nag our, our mate. If we see that we don't appreciate that, then we need to return the kindness as well and not be nagging one another. It tells us, husbands, love your wives and and do not be bitter toward them. Colossians 3.19 Better to dwell in the wilderness than with a contentious and angry woman. Proverbs 21.19 A continual dripping on a very rainy day and a contentious woman are alike. Proverbs 27.15 <coughs> Excuse me. Why do you look at the speck or splinter in your brother's eye? But do not consider the plank, the whole board, the beam that is sticking out of your own eye. Matthew 7 verse 3. And it tells us that love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy and love does not parade itself. 1 Corinthians 13 4. So stop criticizing one another. Stop nagging. Stop finding the faults with one another. You know, the Lord blessed me a long time ago it saying that you know I was pretty good at finding the faults of others you know I had that down pat but that is not what God wants us to do I'm sure that I had way larger faults than than the ones that I was uh, fault finding on so we won't we don't want to do that we want to make sure that we're not good at finding the faults of one another and that's only by the blessings of the Holy Spirit that that we can overcome that if we're having troubles with that we need to take that to the Lord in prayer your spouse might lack much but criticism won't help expecting perfection will bring bitterness to you and your spouse overlook faults and hunt for the good things don't try to reform control or compel your partner you will just you will destroy love only God can change people. A sense of humor, a cheerful heart, kindness, patience, and affection will banish many of your marriage problems. Try to make your spouse happy rather than good, and the good will likely take care of itself. The secret of a successful marriage lies not in having the right partner, but in having, but being the right partner. Number 12, it says, Do not overdo in anything. Be temperate. Everyone who...
competes for the prize, is temperate in all things. Love does not seek its own selfish advantage. Whether you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. I discipline my body and bring it into subjection. 1 Corinthians 9, 27. If anyone will not work, neither should he eat. 2 Thessalonians 3, 10. Marriage is honorable among all, and the bed is undefiled. Hebrews 13, 4. And do not let sin reign in your mortal body, that ye should obey in the lust thereof. And do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness in sin. So there's, there's something that we need to understand, especially in the culture of the United States. I don't know how that it is in the rest of the world, but so often in the United States, a man and a woman will not be chased to the Lord until they're married. And marriage is honorable and the bed is undefiled, but that is only between a husband and his wife. Until that a man or a woman are united in marriage, then the marital bed is forbidden. And if a couple is dating, they have no prerogative to enter into that type of relationship that leads to family. And we need to make sure that we are praying to the Lord, not only that if this is the right uh, situation if I want to marry this woman or if, or if it's a woman and she wants to marry this man if it's God's will but in the courtship we want to make sure and have boundaries that only God would approve of if Jesus was sitting there what would he approve of in your relationship so we don't want to speak in ways that would encourage sinful thinking if we were courting one another we don't want to be doing anything seductive or anything inappropriate with that individual. We want to keep ourselves loyal and chaste to the Lord. And then whenever that it is time for the husband and, and wife to be married, then they may enter in to that which leads to family. But only then after they are married can they enter in to that. And if, if they are doing so, then it, before marriage it is a sin. Before God it is adultery. And if, uh, if, if, if a couple is dating and they're struggling with that, they need to take it to the Lord and understand that God will give them the victory over that. And if they are, if, if they're not able to break that habit, then they need to separate themselves and walk with the Lord and they can, they can come back together when they think that they're going to follow the Lord and be obedient to Him. But God is first. And sometimes it might just be that that person is not the right one for you. Anyone that will lead you into temptation away from the Lord, then we need to consider, is this person the right spouse that God would have for me to do? Because we need to be faithful to God. We want to be chaste unto Him. Honor Him and glorify Him in everything that we do. And not turn to the left or to the right and commit sin. We want to be separate. Separate to Jesus Christ and honor Him. And if you do that, then He will honor you in your marriage if God sees fit for you to be married. Overdoing will ruin your marriage. So will underdoing. Time with God, work, love, rest, exercise, play, meals, and social conduct must be balanced in a marriage or something will snap. Too much work and a lack of rest, proper food and exercise can lead a person to be critical, intolerance, and negative. The Bible also re recommends a temperate sex life, 1 Corinthians 7, 3 through 6, because degrading and intemperate sex acts can destroy love and respect for one another. Social contact with others is essential. True happiness won't be found in isolation. We must learn to laugh and enjoy wholesome good times. To be serious all the time is dangerous. Overdoing or underdoing in anything weakens the mind, body, conscience, and the ability to love and respect one another. Don't let intemperance change or damage your marriage. 
Number 13, respect each other's personal rights and, and privacies. Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy, does not behave rudely, does not seek its own in selfishness, does not rejoice in iniquity, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 7. And it tells us, be, kind, uh, be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love and honor giving preference to one another. Romans chapter 12, verse 10. So it's got a, a wallet right here in the picture. And it says, each spouse has a God-given right to certain personal privacies. Do not tamper with each other's wallets or purses, personal email, or other private property unless given permission. The right to privacy and quietude when preoccupied should be respected. Your husband or wife even has a right to be wrong part of the time and is entitled to a day off without being given the third degree. Marriage partners do not own each other and should never try to force personality changes. Only God can make such changes. Confidence and trust in one another is essential for happiness. So don't check up on each other constantly. Spend less time trying to figure out your spouse and more time trying to please him or her. This works wonders. So if a person that is married needs to have time to maybe go out in the shop and, and uh, tinker and build a little birdhouse, uh, don't begrudge that person. You know, he's, he's right there outside. And if the, if the wife needs time that she wants to go and, and have some uh, quiet time reading the Word of God by herself, we shouldn't begrudge that. In fact, we need to allow that because there needs to, within a husband and wife, there needs to be their personal, private time with the Lord and also their their family circle where they get together for worship as well. Be clean, modest, orderly, and dutiful. In like manner also that the women adorn themselves in modest apparel. 1 Timothy 2, 9. She willingly works with her hands. She also rises while it is yet night and provides food for her household. She watches over the ways of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. Be clean, let all things be done decently and in order. If anyone does not provide for his own, and especially for those of his household, he is denied, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. First Timothy five eight and do not become sluggish, Hebrews six twelve. Laziness and disorder can be used by the devil to destroy your respect and affection for one another and thus harm your marriage. Modest attire and clean, well-groomed bodies are important for both husband and wife. So when we get married, we don't want to just be sitting there and let ourselves get overweight and, and not be keeping ourselves nice and neat. You know, if we grow a, a beard, make sure and kind of keep it nice and clean. And uh, the women should make sure and keep themselves looking respectable for their husbands as well. We want to continue the courtship. Both partners should take care to create a home environment that is clean and orderly. As this will bring peace and calmness, a lazy, shiftless spouse who does not contribute to the household is a disadvantage to the family and is displeasing to God. Everything done for one another should be done with care and respect and carelessness in these seemingly small matters has caused division in countless homes. We also want to make sure and spend as much time as possible with our spouse. That you're, you're far better off being with your spouse as much as possible. Determine to speak softly and kindly. A soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. Proverbs 15, 1. Live joyfully with the wife whom you love. Ecclesiastes 9, 9. When I became a man, I put away childish things. 1 Corinthians 13, 11. So there's something that us men need to learn learn from that, you know, sometimes as a, as a child, we get involved with, with childish things. 
But whenever we become married, we need to understand that we're an adult now. We're married. There might be children on the way, and we need to man up by, by God's power and, and support our families. Always speak softly and kindly to your spouse, even in disputes. Decisions made when angry, tired, or discouraged are unreliable anyway, so it's best to relax and let anger cool before speaking. And when you do speak, let it always be quietly and lovingly. Harsh and angry words can crush your spouse's desire to please you. Number 16, be reasonable in money matters. Love does not envy, is not possessive, does not behave rudely, does not seek its own selfish acts. 1 Corinthians 13, 4 and 5, and it tells us that God loves a cheerful giver. Household income should be shared in a marriage, with each partner having the right to spend a certain portion as desired and according to the family budget. Separate bank accounts tend to remove the opportunity to deepen trust, which is vital for a healthy marriage. Money management is a team effort. Both should be involved, but one should take ultimate responsibility. Money management roles should be determined by personal abilities and preferences. <clears throat> Number 17, talk over things freely with one another. Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself. It is not puffed up. 1 Corinthians 13.4 he who disdains instructions despises his own soul. Proverbs 15, 32. Do you see a man wise as in, own, in, in his own eyes? There is more hope for a fool than for him. Proverbs 26, 12. You know, husband, sometimes a man should listen to his wife. Perhaps she has a very good idea in, in financial matters and different and different things and so we definitely need to be jointly coming together to make the decisions but we do need to understand that the husband is the head of the house just as Christ is the head of the church and so when the matters have been respectfully discussed if it comes down to it that the husband makes that final decision then the wife needs to abide by that Few things will strengthen your marriage more than open discussions on major decisions. Changing a job, purchasing something expensive, and other life decisions should involve both husband and wife, and, di and different opinions should be respected. Talking things over together will avoid many blunders that could greatly weaken your marriage. If after much discussion and earnest prayer opinions still differ, the wife should submit to her husband's decision which should be motivated by his deep love for his wife and his responsibility for her well-being. And it tells us to see Ephesians 5, 22 to 25. So just turn with me there. Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians 5. What did I say? 19 to 22. Ephesians 5, 22 to 25. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Beloved, it gives this appeal. Do you want your marriage to reflect God's unselfish, committed, and joyful love for you? And I hope that that is your desire. And I hope that this study will help you in your in your walk with God and also in your in your marriage life and if you are thinking about getting married I hope that you will study this study guide out 
and, and be in much prayer because marriage is a very serious thing to enter upon and we need to understand the full weight of it that it is for life. It is not just for a five year period. It is for life. And uh, I'm sure that we can all be grateful for the the elderly couples that have been married for 45, 65, 75 years. It's such a blessing and they and they're so they're so sweet and you know sometimes that when when one passes that I've heard that it's not too long after that the other one passes because they were so bound together and I guess heartbroken missing missing their life and missing their spouse and it's it's really hard on them and if you have went through a divorce or if you are a widow or a widower just keep your eyes on Jesus Christ be faithful to him and know that he is your God and he will take care of you and sustain you and allow you to be faithful to him until next time God bless bye bye